Um, the next thing we were going to, oh, we split up for the next one. You went to Hog Processing Continued mm -hmm. by Brandon Sherd. Why don't you talk about that? Um, so pretty much uh, the basis of butchering a pig is um, being efficient by uh, having a sharp knife for one. Always having a sharp knife is a key thing. That's why he's he's, he's like, like don't I always, do it if you don't have it. Like, <laughs> I always carry two really sharp knives and then there's a video that I'm gonna I recorded uh, a link that I'll have Jenny post of a video that he saw. Uh, it's two and a half hour, two and a half hours long, but it sh explains and shows how to properly sharpen a knife the right way. Mm -hmm. And if you have a sharp knife, you have nothing to worry because the other thing he mentioned is when you're cutting with a sharp knife, you notice the difference between tension and bone so when you're cutting when you hit the bone it's not going to go anymore and if you're putting too much pressure you need to stop because you're probably not doing it right um, the, the the way he explained it is like for for let's say for the pig if you're cutting the leg areas to where it's uh where the joints are you, you cut right and you bend the joints and you cut where the joint is and you're gonna cut through the cartilage and the whatever nerves in there and it's gonna just go straight through. But if you're missing it and you just hit the bone, you're gonna know you cut it wrong. So you have to find the right position. Um, that, Same thing kind of with the chicken. You find like, you find the crevice in between. Yeah. yeah. And, um, a lot of people, he also mentioned that uh, a lot of people get deterred by the fat parts of the pig. And in, in, in some ways, the fat parts are what makes the pigs more wealthy because uh, some people for like, let's say sausage, your, your fat percentage is 30% and the rest is meat. So without the fatty part, you're just gonna have this dried up, uh, <coughs> not, mo not moist uh, sausage. Not delicious. You need that fat for it to come out delicious. Well, and that's the like ho homesteaders old fat, like that was the original vegetable oil. Like yeah. you, you use that for everything. Everybody had yep. lard laying around and that's the main thing that people back in the day used to cook mm -hmm. with oh bring out the lard cooked with lard. lard and butter nowadays everybody's like used to all these oils and oils not all oils are healthy for you mm -hmm. for us lard is healthy in a way uh, the other thing is the fat and the meats get preserved really well with salt Mm -hmm. Salt slash sugar blend sometimes depending on what you're doing. Um, did you record? I did. Stuff? I did record some of it. Um, you might be able to blur a little bit of the bottom because there's the uh, the meat, but you, you we could probably put some of that in there. Okay, so I will try to put a clip in for you there. Um, do you think we'll be raising pigs and butchering them ourselves? Um, I want to say not right away. Uh, I do want to raise them and event and take them to get processed, but it's something that you I'm gonna have to work my way to getting comfortable with. The reason why is it's a lot of work, and it's time sensitive too. I can't spend ten hours on trying to butcher a pig. Yeah. Uh, so the more practice you have, the better you get at it. Uh, so I wouldn't mind like going to other butchery classes and learning some more, or if I can get my Maybe hands they can on the haulers when they do one of theirs. Yeah, or if I can get my hands on, like have a hands-on type of thing 
to where I have somebody and I'm helping somebody butcher it uh, and then get better. Once I get better, I'll feel more comfortable. It's just, I wanna make sure, um, one, he was very adamant about how to kill the pig. He wanted to not suffer and not have it be stressed. So you have to make sure it's a clean kill. And you have a clean kill by doing it in the forehead and the brain matter. And, the brain matter. and then once that deed is done, you also got to stab by the spinal cord to where the jugular is. And you have to just, you don't have to slit the neck. You just have to puncture it to where it starts bleeding out. Because, well, and have the machinery to be able to lift it up and just correct. it. And... Uh, the reason for that is if you leave the blood, the, the, the pig's heart is still pumping. So it's still moving blood around the body. And you want that blood not to get stagnant or battered. You want it gone. It. You want it out of its body. by, And the heart will drain it for you if you do it correctly. Right. Uh, and that's how you will make the, the meat taste better and not get the gamey taste. Um, so we, I learned a lot from this, and it, it was just a lot of knowledge. But again, chickens, no doubt I can do it. <laughs> Pig, I'm going to have to take some time to get to that point. So if I can, he's going to give me some of his footage from yeah. the butchery part. But if I can, the second one, I will plug some of that in right here. Threads and scars and ribbons of meat and one perfectly denuded like geometrical protein unit. That's what modern butchery does. So you can totally ignore the poster of the cuts in the butcher shop. That is not your end. Forget about that. That is useless. The way to butcher pigs conventionally, like for the grocery store, that does not serve your kitchen at all. That is the retail form. The point of that is to make money. The point of that way of butchery it's not so that it can be braised and fried and roast. So you can, you are the authority on this. How do you cut this to fit your pot, your pans, and your oven? That is the only goal. I'm not dumbing it down for you. That is the actual reality of the situation. <laughs> the conventional cuts are useless and insipid and dry, and they don't taste that great. Uh, so to that end, we're not going to create any trim, which means when we butcher this pig, by the time we're done, the yield is 100%. Which is totally unheard of. When you take your pig to a butcher or you have someone else do it, you're getting back maybe 50%. They're trimming half the carcass. And, to be honest, it's kind of our fault. We're like, we don't want the fat anymore. We don't want the skin. We don't want the bones. And so, that's all the stuff that they throw away. But if you lose that, then you lose your ability to cure meat traditionally, you lose all the salubrious fat, and you lose uh, all the stock of the broth. Pork, pork bones make excellent broth. And so just harvesting it on your own unlocks most of the yield of the pig. So to that end, to, if we're going to trim off fat, we're gonna do, we, we need to freeze our meat only because we lack the knowledge of how to preserve it without fat. Because the freezer doesn't preserve your meat actually just slows down its degradation into blandness. Whereas fresh meat is so easy to cook, it's so delicious. Frozen meat is hard, you need it, it's a little more effort. Your frozen meat from your own pig that you kill and cut is still gonna be orders of magnitude more delicious than any meat you can buy. So just know that. But the freezer is a great way to achieve freezer avoidance. You can use your brine to avoid the freezer. I think I said that. The brine is your key to freezer avoidance. And so what I do is I dissolve. For my brine recipe, I use five gallon totes like this, buckets. Food grade five gallon buckets work. In a pot on your stove, just boil 14 quarts of water and then put four and a half pounds of salt in there. And if you want to, four and a half pounds of sugar or sugar and molasses. 
in your stomach. You don't have to do the sugar, it is nice. Um, and stir it up so that all of those, uh, the salt and the sugar dissolve, and then you refrigerate that brine. And when it is totally refrigerator chilled, then you can start putting your ham in there, and your hops, and your chops, and anything. There's no part of the paint that you cannot put in the brine. Yes. Do I use a specific salt? Uh, it's easier to say that I don't use like three salts because they all work. They all work. So natural sea salt is what I use for everything. Um, Redmond salt is great. I happen to have that today. That works beautifully. Um, the only salt I don't use, a very short list. Uh, I don't I don't use any curing salts. I have the nitrite or the nitrate mixed in there. A couple of amros. Um, and I don't use the kosher Merton Morton's kosher salt because it doesn't taste nice. It's just pure sodium chloride. It's actually a very salty salt. It's crazy salty. And that flake structure makes it really easy to oversalt things, which we're going to talk about like right now. Um, when it comes to curing things, you'll find that the easiest thing to do is to oversalt. That's the easiest. So it's nice to have a salt like Redmond's or a natural salt that has some other minerals besides pure lab isolated sodium chloride um, that will dilute the saltiness a little bit, um, have better flavor. So all that to say, I don't use Merton's flake salt. I don't use table salt because it has magnesium stearate in it as an anti casing agent. Kind of gross. Um, and but everything else works. Anything else? No, I don't use iodized salt. The other one. You don't want it to taste uh, marine. You know, you don't want that flavor. Fishy. Big. All right. So what we have left here is the sirloin. This happens to have, when you go to make your own pig, or harvest your own pig, and you want to make your own sausage, uh, you need the primary ingredients of a delicious sausage. And this is like the basic ingredients that will work for pate, like a loaf pate, like a meatloaf, um, and anything that you do with brown pork. You're going to want at least 30% fat. And then you're going to want lovely, fresh, home-raised uh, muscle tissue. And then you're going to want to grind all of that and salt it at 1.8% by weight. Or if you're like me, 2% by weight. And if you do 2%, it's a little more salt, but that also, 2% so happens to be what tastes beautiful, tastes perfectly. We're not used to that high of a salt level, but you can get used to it, you can adjust to it. It also happens to be the exact quantity of salt that you would apply to preserve 2% salt by weight tastes great and preserves the meat. Come to find out. Um, so it's a good ratio to remember. So if you do nothing but take this piece of meat, the sirloin, or the shoulder, because they both have at least 30% fat fat, and you remove the bones, and then you grind that fat and meat, and then you salt it 2% by weight, that will be the best sauce you've ever tasted. If it's a pig you have raised, honestly, I guarantee it. Um, because you have the elements of good sausage. Most sausage that you buy is lots of chemical binders, you know, and uh, it lacks the quality and the flavor, specifically in the quality of the fat. It's just not a sweet fat, it's a little bit. And uh, whereas the sausage that you make that way, absolutely. And any spices or herbs you put in there will just be icing on the cake, they're just for fun. We frequently make sausage with only salt. Salt, 30% fat, and then the lean meat. All right, we've got the front shoulder now. And in the US at least, this part, where the back is, the head was right here. From the spine up, this is the Boston butt. And then from the spine down, we tend to call this the picnic, picnic shoulder. And then we've got the hawk and the trotter. Yeah. And to remove this trotter, you fully bend it. See, there's two primary articulation points where it bends, two joints. If you go right in between them, that will be where there is a very convenient uh, metacarpal joint. And then I'll hang it off the table. It's the same thing. Apply pressure. And just with the tip of your knife, nick the tendon. 
and you know you're you're not on the right spot if you ever find yourself having to use force with your knife. Uh, this is why it's really important to learn how to sharpen your knives because if your knife is very sharp, you will you will never find yourself tearing down on things. Whereas you can soft meat and fat with a dull knife, it will feel like bone, right? But with a sharp knife, bone is very obvious. You know, you're just slipping through the meat and then the knife stops on the bone. And so if you ever find yourself cutting meat, you're doing this and the veins are popping out on your forehead and you're doing a lot of sawing, you have a dull knife. You have a dull knife. I don't care if it cuts paper or shaves arm hair or into your fingernail, your knife is quite dull. And I would recommend to you um, a resource for how to sharpen knives. It's a very simple resource. Um, it's old and kind of funny, but uh, it is a video that is free on the YouTube by a guy named Murray Carter. And he made it many years ago. And it's two hours and 40 minutes long. It's uh, Carter Cutlery. Blade Sharpening Fundamentals. It used to be a DVD back before those went extinct. And I would bring DVDs and I would sell them at these events because that video changed my life. Have a sharp knife, it's everything. And it's uh, Carter Cutlery Blade Sharpening Fundamentals on YouTube. Make a lot of coffee, it's a little boring. It's two hours and 40 minutes long, but you just need to watch it once, then you get it, it is simple. It's just a little bit of time spent in advance of what you So you notice I do not have... If not, then we're moving on to the next one. And Even if it's just audio, just to listen yeah. what he's saying is cool too. So while he was doing the breaking down the meat, um, I went to go watch Jill from Whispering Willow um, talk about maximizing your small space. Now... I've watched her on YouTube for a long time. I follow her on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And there was some stuff that I already knew that she talked about. But there was other stuff that hit differently when she was talking. And, and now that I've had a year a season in gardening um, out in a bigger bed, I still realize like there is a difference when it comes to heirloom in hybrid and I kind of had a misconception when it came to some hybrid um and so she really cleared a lot of that stuff up um and I will probably be getting a few hybrid things I'm still gonna grow all my heirlooms don't worry about it but I'm probably gonna buy a few hybrid things um that way I have a couple of high producing plants um in the ground along with them um so i'm maximizing my space and then i can do a comparison this next year on some of the hybrids some of the heirlooms and things like that um, because it's more of a you still your get your heirlooms and then you also get your quantity well, by your hybrids you can have heirloom hybrids that's what's funny so oh. a hybrid can become an heirloom eventually so you have different level of hybrids, but basically <clears throat> if you have a Dr. Witchies and an Abe Lincoln tomato, tomatoes planted next to each other, their seeds can cross pollinate and create a hybrid tomato. Mm. The, the thing is, is that each one of those seeds uh, may or may take on different parts of each of the parent plants. It's not a stable hybrid. Um, so, hybrids, you can get something different, right? right? And so, once a hybrid becomes, it's not like an F1 or an F2 or whatever it is, whatever level it is, then it can become a stabilized hybrid. And at some point, each variety of a tomato, like Brad Gates does that and creates these stabilized hybrids that are now tomatoes that can get passed on and they're sold at yeah. rare seeds which sells heirloom tomatoes so it's it's just a different line on where it is you just can't save the seeds from them mm -hmm. and get exactly and, and 
for sure get exactly the same speed because it's not stabilized. Right. And so for that, having heirlooms is important to be able to save seeds in an emergency situation and be able to grow, right? Or you can save seeds for the hybrid and just not know what you're going to get. Um, but it was, it was interesting. I also learned a little bit more about succession planting. Um, and what soil she uses to start her seeds. Um, but so we talked about choosing what crops, um, trellising and succession planting. And, um, I am going, I, we may try, I'm going to talk to my husband about the trellising system. So there's some things that we may try. I don't know if we're going to try it this next year or we may try some in the future. Um, but there are a few things that I want to look into, um, that she talked about. And so I can pop a portion of her talk right here. Starting out, I did not grow everything. I chose one thing and I learned how to grow that one thing really well. And then the next year I grew the other thing. And then by year three, I was like, well, how do I grow everything to make enough salsa for the year for my family? And that's what I did. I grew enough varieties of things, the same few crops. And I really just had to start shifting and figure out, instead of overwhelming myself, instead of the entire garden going to weeds, how do I gradually do this? Also, too, um, I'll t this is my pep walk in with you guys. He taught me how to garden. When I was a kid, I hated it because uh, I had to spend all of my summers weeding his garden. And now as an adult, I know I got that job. And I tell my kids, I'm like, listen, Mama had to do it. Now it's your turn. Um, okay, but one of the first things I want to talk about is choosing what crops to grow. Now, this is where, how many of you guys are homesteaders? Backyard gardeners, yeah, okay, hold on. I might rock your world, don't hate me, okay? Um, so I grew up learning how to garden for my papa that you just saw. My papa only grew heirloom varieties. I remember every year, I mean, that's all we were getting for Christmas present, right? It was this homemade jam and a salsa. And so that was really my only influence, to be honest, as a kid. I don't remember my parents having a garden. I remember my papa Kenneth had several acres that he cultivated with his, you know, neighborhood, kind of. It's just how he grew up. You all, you know, gardened in community. And so when I started getting into gardening as I was an adult, I thought if it wasn't an heirloom, it had to be bad. Anybody else think that? Yeah, right? Because, one, that's just what Papal did, and I didn't know any different. When I started researching how to maximize your small space, I started hearing a lot about hybrids. And so I immediately, like, put a big X up, right? I was like, absolutely not. I'm not growing a hybrid. Papa didn't do that. It has to be bad. And so I'm sure many of you guys already know this, but I do want to do a quick overview of an heirloom and a hybrid because I want to talk about the difference because growing hybrid varieties, you're really going to be able to maximize your space. And I want to kind of debunk some of those things that myself included thought about hybrids starting out. So an heirloom seed is a seed that's been passed down for generations. They're open pollinated. Many of us are growing them because their flavor, their unique characteristics, the options. If you've ever been to Great Baker Creek, like enough said, right? You can get lost in there for days. That's really cool. That's a story. I still grow my papa's green beans that he has been saving the seeds since my childhood. Now they do not produce the most but that's worth me walking out into my garden telling my kids that story, right? So you will always still find a place for heirlooms in my garden. However, that is not primarily what I'm growing because they just don't produce. They, you know, they tell a great story. They have great flavor. They're super unique. But they aren't bred like a hybrid is to be high producing. So then let's move on to the hybrid, right? These are varieties that are the offspring of two parent plants. And they are bred specifically to be disease resistant, to be high producing, and the best part is to grow well in various climates, which makes it perfect for a beginner, right? Because if you're a beginner and you're trying to figure out what zone you're in, you're trying to figure out what soil, all these other things, it can be really confusing. And then you have certain varieties that only do well in certain climates versus a hybrid. It's gonna be super universal as to where you're growing, it's going to be super forgiving. It's not going to need as much maintenance. 
because it was bred to just be resilient in a lot of ways. And so for me, one thing I do want to say too, we are a certified naturally grown farm. That means I can only use certified seed. I can only use any sort of certified inputs. You can buy certified organic hybrid seeds. They does, does not mean that they're GMO. They're not genetically modified at all. And I think that's the number one thing people think. They think if it's a hybrid, it has to be genetically modified. It's not. It's not. Most of the hybrid seeds are hand cross-pollinated out in the field. Unlike genetically modified, it's being done in the lab. That is not it. That's not how it goes at all. Now, there are some downsides to growing hybrids. I can't save the seeds, right? They're not going to be true to that parent plant. So, again, figure out, like, what are your goals? For me, my goal was on a small backyard garden to grow enough food for my family year-round and to sell to farm-to-table restaurants. I was able to do that on a half an acre pretty successfully just because I chose the right varieties. Okay, so after that, um, we had a lunch break, and we went through, and we got the final stuff that we were going to buy for the day. We did stop by Mindful Farmer and got one of his little tools and some of his soil, which is what was Brianna Willow uses to he, start her seeds. He was very insightful, too, with <laughs> pest stuff. Yes, so um, he brought up some ideas for seed that he likes for caterpillars. Um, and uh, I got to see his tools that he's been working on creating, and I do really want some, but we only got one that was smaller um, for now, and we'll save up and get some of the other ones. Um, but I do, I did get some of his soil um, yeah. to try it for seed starting. Um, I got a small amount so I can purchase some more later on. After that, we got to watch um, hear Kevin and Sarah from Living Traditions mm -hmm. uh, talk about their journey from suits to soil. So uh, they both had corporate jobs in Phoenix, Arizona, and ended up running a farm in Missouri. And um, how that journey kind of happened, and I will tell you the inspiration and the... the um, the inspiration and the feeling seen on the journey we're currently on was um, amazing. He ended up in line to get food almost the entire talk because um, we hadn't eaten. Well, and so time and everybody was in line. Everybody everywhere. was in line. And so it took almost an hour to get food at the food truck. So he missed most of it, but I was telling him about it. And um, I can, I'm going to pop a clip in, um, but really talking about them coming and how they knew they were going to, how they knew what they needed to do and where they're going to end up, mm -hmm. but waiting for God's timing and waiting for, uh, the right timing, but not just waiting in, in doing nothing in all the things that they learned and the spaces they were in and what they did and, um, really following God and what he's leading them to do. And, um, it was just, it was a really, really good talk and um in our process in our journey and where we are right now um it was amazing i mean we waited we knew we were going to move for three years yeah. and we waited we waited for the timing we believe that god called us to leave and we did and now we're waiting for the next part on where we're permanently landing and um you're still trying things Still learning, still learning. trying, still using the classroom, getting the skills ready, yeah. going to conferences like this. Um, so that was a really good talk. I will pop in right here um, some of their talk, and I hope you enjoy that. Um, seven years before the Lord made it all come together. So uh, one thing we wanted to let you all know is that if you guys were in a place of waiting, we on YouTube or whatever, we, it seems like it, ha it can happen overnight, or it did happen overnight. Really. Um, but we really have waited and planned and pushed for that day where we can move and leave our jobs for seven years. We waited patiently. So it's not an overnight thing. We just want to let you guys give you kind of some perspective on that. So. So for us, 
we want to go through first and kind of tell you our story, maybe a little more in depth than what we've ever talked about on YouTube, because on YouTube we can't fit everything into 15 or 20 minutes. But this is going to be more of a, instead of a, a like how to, it's more of a how we did it. And we hope that some of this will apply to some of you out there, that you'll pray about how this might fit into your life and how it might be able to transition into something that will grow into something great for you. So Sarah and I met when we were 19 years old. Sarah was in college. We met in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, which is where I grew up. She was in college. I was a guy who hung out at the coffee shop on the college campus. <laughs> <laughs> and so we met. I think she, she I had long hair. I had longer hair than Sarah back then. <laughs> and so I think she liked my long hair. But you know, that's another thing. So we met and we got married when we were 22 years old in 1998. So this last month we celebrated 26 years of marriage. So we turned up to us together. Um, from the time we got married in 1998 until about 2009, we were very career-driven people. Like we we were just we were gonna we were gonna do the American dream. We were gonna have high pressure, high stress, job. We were going to work ourselves to death sitting in a cubicle and we were going to have a big house in a fancy neighborhood with a perfect lawn and, you know, nice cars and I, I had a Harley and I was, you know, and it, it was just, you know, we were living the dream. Two kids. Two kids. I mean, it was the whole thing. A daughter, two kids, a big house, two cars, I mean, and all the death and all of the stress that went with all of that. But no cats. <laughs> and then around 2008-2009, I was having some, some issues. If you follow our channel, you know I have psoriasis, I have a lot of skin issues, and my joints were getting really sore, and I was starting to get arthritis, and I was 32 years old. And we started to, to try to figure out what was going on. So we started to make some changes in our lives. We started to switch to more natural products. We started to you know, eliminate things off our, of our diets. And one day we were watching, I think on Netflix, and we saw a documentary called Who the Cake? And that was in 2008. And we watched that documentary, and actually Joel Salton was in that documentary. And within days we were like, what is going on? It's scary to death. Like, because we're both the kind of people who need to figure stuff out. And after we watched that, and we started to realize kind of how we were being poisoned by our food and the system that we were all buying into, we decided we needed to start to make some changes. So we, in our tiny little backyard, with a block Fence around a block wall. In Dover, Arizona, in the desert. In, in that area in the city, everybody has at least an eight foot high block wall all around their, their property, the tiny little property. You can't ever see your neighbors. It's really kind of weird. When you go out here, nobody has a fence anywhere. It's very weird. So we, we, so we turned into like the crazy neighbors. And we turned our entire backyard into a little tiny little urban homestead. Started with gardening. Now to tell you the kind of neighborhood that we lived in, there was a time when we were getting fined fifty dollars a day because the cable running up the side of our house to our satellite dish wasn't painted the exact same color as the house, and you could see it from the road. So because we couldn't paint it to match the house, so it couldn't be seen from the road, we got fined fifty dollars a day by the homeowners association. So that's, that's where we started being crazy. And if, so, you're, if we refused to pay it, they would put a lien on our house if we ever tried to sell it. Right. So that, just to give you an idea of the, the type of neighborhood we're talking about. So, so after watching that, like Sarah said, we started to turn our entire backyard into a garden. And we had raised beds, we had tomatoes growing up taller than the walls around our yard. And we did that for about, I don't know, two years, maybe, while we, I mean, we were still working for a job during that time. And then we were like, you know, we should get some chickens. <laughs> so why not, right? So, so we're, first of all, that was like illegal in nature way to get chickens. And second of all, you all know what getting chickens means. Like, it's like it's the gateway. Gate yeah. <laughs> and at that time, we were really naive, and we didn't know that chickens make so much noise. And so that is when we started 
bribing neighbors with eggs and tomatoes. Right. If you were to start on a new property again, where do you start first? Where do you suggest somebody starts? As far as like projects and yeah. that type of thing? The question is, if we were to start all over again and again, <laughs> where would we start? I always start with an orchard. True. I always start with the plants that are going to take the longest to mature and produce fruit, food. Like every every home that we've had, that we don't do a lot of permanent things for at least the first six months because you really need to learn your land, and you don't want to plant a bunch of things or put up a bunch of buildings in areas that later on you realize it could have been, you know, in a much better area or it just you know we try to design all of our stuff to be kind of like the stuff we use frequently is closest to the house. Like on our first home we had here in Missouri, we had our greenhouses kind of tucked back behind the buildings. It was kind of convenient to go back there. So we just did go back there as much as we did. Yeah. When we put up our greenhouse on our new place, like you see it from the front porch. So it's like right there. We have to walk past it to go through the animals. We, you know, so it's, but that's if you don't know that when you first move somewhere. So give it some time and get to know your land before you make some big decisions. You'll go through every season. You know, where does it flood? Where does it not flood? Because, you know, we know people who have put up buildings in an area that, that ends up being underwater because they didn't wait long well enough to figure all of that out. One intentional thing that we have uh, decided was that we weren't going to, and now I don't want to speak against anybody who's made this decision, it was just ours. Uh, we wanted to always buy a place that had somewhere to live on it already. Um, because we know that buying raw land is hard, and we wanted to get out there and start homesteading, and we felt like, you know, we wanted to go hit the ground running, regardless of the state of the house. I mean, we haven't lived in fancy houses, and we're very blessed that this house we have on our new property is new, and we're, we thank God so much for that. Um, but. That was important to us, to have a place to live. But we also knew we didn't have the skill, you know, some people have the skill to build a house. Yeah. I could build a house out of pallets, <laughs> or if you wanted to live in a hoop coop. <laughs> but the other thing Sarah is... Sarah didn't want to do that. <laughs> the other thing is, when we did buy a place and had a house, we made, we made a promise that we weren't going to do it any big changes inside the house for at least three to six months. Because those things that really bother you at first in the house when you move in, after three to six months, they might not be that big of a deal. Like, who cares? Right. You know? And in, mo in most cases, the things that irritated me the most in a house, I didn't really care about it afterwards. You know, I, I didn't really care. I didn't want to waste the time. If you're living this lifestyle, you're not going to spend much time in the house anyway. Sure. So after those, we stayed uh, where we were sitting and listened to a faith family and farm panel and that was with um sean and beth gordy joel salatin uh, kevin and sarah from living traditions and lisa bass from farmhouse on boom and the pres uh, the lady who put this whole thing together she um she asked them each three different questions um we were kind of at a weird angle so um I'll pop them in right here though so you can see those because we really yeah, yeah we got some of the footage of it and she'll put that here. yeah it, it I really enjoyed the answers um and they were really good so enjoy okay so I'm going to ask each one of you um how has your faith affected what you do as far as a lifestyle goes well, I, uh, my faith affects, hopefully, affects everything that I do. Um, I, one, one of the things that's been wonderful to see is, as we have, and I shared this with you in the last talk, as we have gone deeper into agrarianism, as we've gone deeper into this world, it reveals so much about God, about the Bible, about how to live, um, and I, I love the fact that it has convicted us that God is such a good God. 
that he created a world in which we are to fit, and if we use his methods, uh, it works. Everything gets better, and uh, we are fed with great abundance. So that's, it's, been a, it's been a it's a road toward seeing God's love in action. So I'm going to turn that one around a little bit. The question you said, how is my faith informed our farm? I'm a convert. I'm an adult convert. And I'm, I'm an adult convert, not from some other Christian faith, but from no faith at all and no belief in God. Um, and I gave my heart very completely to that at 20. But giving your heart isn't the same thing as having your whole mind and soul open to be that gift. So my mind and soul are trained in 20 years of being secular. So what farming has done is taken my intellectual assent to the truths of Christianity and made them concrete for me. And I watched that journey happen, not so much in the beginning when we were struggling to, you know, whole sacks and sacks of feed to a bunch of animals in different places, and it was all fun and kind of pretty, and then it was messy and a lot of work. And the kids didn't get it because it didn't really make sense. It was when we began to see how the pieces of the puzzle fit together to make farms really work, you know, like, how does sunlight make it an ecosystem work that my intellectual belief that God is good and loves me and the universe became a concrete, steadfast, the thing I know better than I know anything else in the world is that God loves me and he made a beautiful, wonderful, abundant world that's full of goodness and I'm living in it and farming shows that to me every day. <laughs> Follow up. Take that, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Always comes back to haunt you. So, uh, <clears throat> so for me, it's a couple things. One is to realize it's all God's stuff. It's not mine. And as soon as you eliminate your ownership uh, and you realize I'm just a steward of somebody else's stuff, um, you hang on to it a little less. You, you're very concerned about what that owner thinks about the way you're taking care of his stuff. And especially when it's an owner who has put it together as an object lesson of his expression of himself to us. And so what we want is for people to drive out of our lane or visit our farm and, have, and say, oh, that's what forgiveness looks like. Oh, that's what provision looks like. Oh, that's what abundance looks like. Uh, as a, as, so a farm becomes a physical manifestation of spiritual truth. That's the idea. Yeah, I think learning to rely on, on patience, learning to rely on God. You know, when we made the decision to leave our jobs and moved to the country almost a decade ago. Now. I had two little kids, I had a wife, I was responsible for all of that. And so I had to listen to my father to tell me what was the right decision to make. And doing so, I think, really taught us that we need to slow down, we need to be on his time, and we need to listen. And I feel like as we've changed our homestead, as we've changed what we do over time, that's a lesson that's always We've, we've relied heavily on, on prayer. Um, we've seen God bring people in and out of our lives that maybe shouldn't be here, um, but He brings people in and out to do things that we, you know, that that we can't do or that we just need those people around us at the time. Uh, one thing Sarah and I don't talk about on YouTube is that we're part of a church plant uh, in our area for Calvary Chapel, um, and you know, in a community of, of not many people, um, we've all grown three buildings. And, three and a half years and so uh, God's bringing the people that we need and I think we just need to continue to rely on him you know if, if, if he takes care of the birds why won't he take care of us <laughs> this is getting harder <laughs> 
<laughs> um, how has it grown in my faith? You know, living this lifestyle, you could, do, you could do get up when the sun rises and see the miracle that God has given you that day. And you get to work with the animals in a process that you designed as perfect. It's just, um, you know, it, it's just awe. I mean, I'm just in awe all the time about how good he is and how perfect he is. The other thing that strikes me every time I read my Bible is how much of what we do every day is described and talked about in the Bible. So many, so many things that we do we're milking cows, we're taking care of animals, and um, you know, it's, it gives me another connection with God, who, who designed all of this to be perfect. I just feel much closer to Him, knowing that I'm actually doing things that have been done for hundreds of thousands of years in the perfect way that He designed. Okay, so all of that, <laughs> and I was going to say, with all of the children we have in the homeschooling, and I'm having to think of that right now with our family, I feel like it's a very naturally sanctifying thing that requires that daily to happen, whether or not you want it to, with the patience building, that's been, I think, the biggest impact for me. Well, how important is is it to you to have your family involved in what you do? We hear a lot about people saying, you yeah, know, well, I want to do this, or my father want to do this, but my husband's not on board, or my family's not on board, or my kids are not on board. Um, so how important it is for you to have your family involved in what you do, and um, have they always been supportive of that? And what does that look like for you? And I'm going to start on this end. <laughs> well, I... I grew up on a farm, and so I knew I wanted that rural lifestyle. I grew up in 4-H and with cattle and all that kind of stuff, but my husband did not. But oddly now, that pretty much all falls on him and a lot of the kids. So, yeah, uh, supportive and enjoys it. They didn't know that they wanted to, but it's very important. I think it's good work for kids. It's something that has to happen every day, so kind of like that natural sanctifying thing. It, it also it kind of forces you to have a schedule and rhythm, and I really appreciate that. Well, from a different perspective of that, Kevin and I didn't really have much support from our parents to make this decision, and that was very hard. Uh, but we really needed to trust that the Lord was leading us into this lifestyle, and trust that later on, either He would bring them along to understand what we were doing, or we would just continue, which He did or we would just continue following him and what he was calling us to do. Uh, we started homesteading when our kids were, I would say, a little bit on the older side, and I guess um, we really didn't want to ram all of this down their throats and not want to you know, be resented for it, and our kids know how to do everything that we do, um, and we told them how, why we think it's important to do everything that we do in hopes that it's made an impression on them that will want, make them want to do it for themselves and their kids. Um, but that's, that's our prayer for our kids is that they, you know, once they get through the age where, you know, they know everything and we don't know anything, that they'll come back to this kind of lifestyle for their family. Praise God, they both come to the Lord and we're so proud of them for that and that's, you know, our biggest accomplishment that we could ever ask for. Um, but, you know, we also pray that they see the value in this. And, uh... That was my answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to actually jump into the future just a little bit. You know, our oldest daughter just got married last year, and hopefully we'll be starting a family in the coming years. And so uh, I'm really looking forward to those days when I can have grandkids. Um, and we can start kind of over again with, with little ones and raise them up in this life. Um, I think it's going to be so important, especially in that generation, where we're, it's even further disconnected from, from everything that's happened in the past. I mean, they're, they're not going to have any recollection of a normal life like those of you, like we did, you know, before computers, before smartphones, all this stuff. And we're really hoping that, you know, we can help kind of corrupt that generation with some common sense. <laughs> so, you know, Jesus didn't have the support of his family. 
Think about that. And so, <coughs> I think what we need to do is do what God, what we believe deep down God wants us to do, and do it with a conviction that is so profound that if it draws family, fine. But we can be okay if it doesn't draw family. Because if we come into this thinking that we have failed if our kids don't buy into it, we will very quickly give the perception to our children that there's conditional love. And that's not a good thing. So, um, when our kids were teenagers, I told them that we will be your best cheerleaders no matter what you want to do. But if you don't want the farm, I'm going to find a young person to give it to you. Because the farm is more important. The, the, the legacy of what God's called me to do in my mission is that important. We were blessed with one of our two, Daniel, really took the farm and now runs it day-to-day -day operations. Daughter's nearby, but she's not involved in the farm. She doesn't dislike the farm. She just didn't have a love for it. But if you... If you, I hope I'm making myself clear about the difference between doing what you're supposed to do without any expectations and just unconditional love versus we're going to do this in a family and you're going to like it and if you don't, I failed and you failed. There's a it's not a difference of semantics. It's a big deal. And so uh, so that, that's where I am with, with the family. Go forward with what you're supposed to do. If they want to follow you, great. And if they don't, that's okay too. Kind of <laughs> a family friendly farming. There's so, many, there's so many ways to understand your question, so many angles that we could come at that question from. So I'm just going to tell one really short story that's part of my answer. Um, because it relates to how our kids related and relate now to what we do. Many years ago, we had eight children, five boys, two girls, and another boy, spaced out over 21 years. So we've had a lot of kids around for a lot of years. And many years ago, Sean and some of the boys were working on a project. Hot summer afternoon, getting along to her, chore time, dinner time. She likes telling the story. Because <laughs> it, it, he thinks it reflects badly on him. It does not. Um, so they were wi winding up. Sean is definitely a meals on time kind of guy. And our son Thomas, number two, is an artist and a perfectionist. And so Sean is wanting to get done. And Thomas, at this point, has a suggestion. Now, wouldn't this be better if we tried this? Now, this is coming out of like a 14-year-old kid. So he's got some good ideas, and he, he knows what he's talking about. And Sean says, it just doesn't matter. Just finish it, and we're going in. We're, you know, we're going to do chores and have dinner. And Thomas turned on, and he said, if it doesn't matter, then this is your hobby, and I am your hobby slave. <laughs> now that should go straight to your heart. They shouldn't be our hobby slaves. But is this our hobby? It is not our hobby. And as we discovered and were able to share with our children, indelible patterns for how food comes to be. And it became clear to them that we don't just grow our food because we like it. We 
we grow our food because it's not anybody else's job to grow our food. And if anybody else does it, they're not going to do it as well as we do it. And as they began to see that there are real creation patterns whereby food comes to be and soil becomes more fertile and everything gets more beautiful and abundant, they saw that it's not our hobby. And they stopped, if they ever did, leaving that aside now for a moment, feel like our hobby slaves. And they realized we're all servants of creation. We're God's servants in service to creation. And that, for me, is the best part of what we do and our kids being grown up, is that whether they got it, whether they understood at the time. John always said to them, I don't need you to approve of my choices right now. I'll ask you when you're 36. <laughs> They're 36 now, and they like it. So I, I do think that um, they're living in my house. We are all working together. Um, that they do, that you need to participate in the thing that we're doing. Um, so you need to help us do food. Um, that's what we're always spend a tremendous amount of time doing food. And you're eating here, so you are expected to participate in that. But there comes a time when they become an adult. And they make choices for themselves, and I think that's fine. And I think acknowledging that kids need instruction is fine, and that that's what adults are for is fine. Um, so I, I do think that there is a time for them to do what the family does, but then that has to be the least at some point, and then they have to do it. But the other thing that, that you said, I think. Um, what we have to do is what's best for the family. And if I've decided as uh, that being a homesteader is best for the family, nobody else is going along with that, I really have to check myself and say, maybe that's not what's best for the family. Uh, even if I'm convinced that homesteading is, is the thing that we need to be doing. It's, it's got to be a family. We've got to work together as a family. So once we're all in, we're all participating. But it shouldn't be one person dominating and making all the final decisions that we have to So what is your, what's your most favorite thing? What do you get the most satisfaction from doing on your farm? It doesn't have to be livestock, but, and, and why? I love working with my kids. And the greatest thing that happened to me is my house burning down because now we're all building it together and I am having the time of my life. It is a huge project. So our house burned down about a year and a half ago and um, everybody says, oh, I'm so sorry. But in the family, they, they all had some skills. I mean, we all did some of this stuff. But I had an architect, a plumber, a general contractor, a mason. Uh, you name it, we got it. And uh, so after the house burned, uh, I immediately said, we're going to rebuild it. And, uh, and that's what's been happening, is that my, my wife, my, my son said to my wife, so what is it that you want? And she said, I want exactly what we had before. And my architect's son said, we'll talk. <laughs> and, and he has been asking us, well, how should no come into the house? I mean, we had a hundred-year-old house that we had been working around, and now we have the opportunity to solve all the problems with it, and the, the, it's a family project, and we, it, it's timber framed on the bottom, and it's got, you know, it, it's just a dream house. So this has been absolutely the, uh, I, I've always loved working with them, but have this wonderful problem is the greatest thing that's happened. Yeah, I'll admit that it's sort of overwhelming to see how God um, introduces his blessings in these crazy ways, like watching your house burn down. Um, but on the farm, absolutely, my favorite thing to do is cows and grass. I love moving fence and watching cows affect and watching how the grass affects the cows. I've never... Um, I, I was one of the students who got A's by being clever, not by being smart. And, um, and I was, so I, you know, like the universe did not make sense to me. 
and, and it begins to make sense now. And I love the education that I get from, you know what I really love? Here's what I love. Is that when you're a kid, you wish for two things. You wish you could talk to animals, and like they would respond, and you wish you belonged. You know, when you go out and say, oh, I need some time in the nature, and you go lie in a field, you wish you actually liked it when you got there. But in point of fact, you don't. You lie down, you go, man, there are bugs, and it's scratchy, you know, good. I now love to lie in fields. I belong there. They're my community. The, I, I, when you spend a lot of time helping things grow and be themselves better than they could do by themselves, you're welcome. You know you're at home and at family. I love that. So I've got two. You asked for one, but I just can't separate the two. Um, the first one is the just the honor and privilege of being able to step out the back door every morning and participate as hands and feet of stewardship. And you know, as we know our story, know that you know we came in 1961, and the place was the gully rock pile, cheapest, most worn out farm in the whole region. That's why it was cheap. And mom bought it. And uh, to, in my short life, to have seen those gullies and rocks, soil build up over the rocks, gullies grow trees, and 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 fields that, you know, when I started driving the tractor at 13, I remember well having to put 16, I counted 16 rake swaths together to make one little windrow. <clears throat> And today, two rake swaths make a windrow you can't jump over. And to, to see that kind of redemptive capacity in the land and to, to be a part of it. When I realize it's God's, I'm giving him a cool return on investment. You know, in business terms, he's getting a real ROI from our stewardship and he entrusted me. Sorry, trust me. Do that for me. It's pretty cool. Number two, for me, is most farmers, when they get to my age, are the loneliest they've ever been in life. Kids are gone. Nobody wants to farm. You know, you're starting to feel in your aches and pains. You're not jumping up and down off the tractor as sprightly as you did in your 20s. The work still has to be done and you're alone. And for me to be able to every day be surrounded by 20 something enthusiastic, energetic, young people, staff, um, apprentices, stewards. And I'm the old guy, except for my mom who's still alive at 100 in nine months. <laughs> but to be surrounded by this amazing group of young people who for the th who view the things that I have done all my life as the coolest thing since I get together eggs? I get together eggs? Really? Yeah, I get together eggs. You know? Oh wow, this is so good. I mean, the affirmation of that, the honor of that, and to be surrounded by that kind of energy. Let's move this mountain. Let's move this stack of wood. Let's pick up a truckload of rocks. Let's be, you know, and just to have that um, around me at the time when all of, when most farmers my age are lonely is just uh, an unspeakable, unspeakable. So for me, I think the, the coolest thing is that Sarah and I get to spend every day together. And it's just the two of us now, and we get to work together every single day, and, and that's really a dream. So uh, first, first and foremost, that's, that's that. Uh, as far as the actual farming goes, um, I mean, I kind of agree how the grass are, are pretty cool. When you see a bull get so excited about new grass that he's like, you know, you like, you're a little worried for your life. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty awesome. And then, you know, if you've never sprayed a pig with a garden hose, I mean, that's pretty awesome too. So, I mean, there's just so many little cool things that every day just, you know, 
can waste so much time and make you stand there and be in awe. So but, uh, there's lots of cool stuff. I think my favorite thing, well, I've always really loved to um, make good food for my family. I feel like I'm really providing a service. And it, it is such a different level of providing good food for your family when you have such a connection with where that food came from. Like, I'm completely blown away just thinking about, preparing to answer this, like, the connection I feel with the garden, the connection I feel with my dairy cow, the connection I feel when I'm using the things that I pull out of the garden, or when I milk my cow, what I make for my family, and it's, it's overwhelming how, how big that whole process is to provide good food for my family and how well, just an amazing process that is it's overwhelming. I, I can't even explain it. Like you know the warm fuzzies that you get. Like I, I get the warm fuzzies making food for my family with the produce that I just picked, with the dairy that I just milked, with the chicken that we just that's kind of gruesome but just butchered. But you know what I'm saying? And like like the smell of dairy cows, the smell of cows, not really the smell of pigs and chickens, but, you know, I mean, it's just, that's my favorite, just having such an amazing relationship with the food that we provide and grow and raise, but then I can turn it into amazing food to feed my family or my church. It's just an amazing relationship. That's my favorite. Pretty much say the same thing. <laughs> uh, the kitchen is definitely my favorite. So the abundance whenever we're milking cows and we have to do something with all that milk, making butter, cheese, which is sort of like it's kind of fun. <laughs> Yogurt, uh, stuff from the garden, eggs, having herbs hanging up, just all of that abundance is in the kitchen. It's my favorite for sure. I find it amazing. Amazing how much um people all throughout talked about being weird and talked about not fitting in and families not understanding and and all of these things and there's a whole group of people there are thousands of people there and um we all had similar things not everybody is a christian not everybody um not everybody believes exactly the same thing but there's a whole lot of people who are coming to this who believe in this who who believe the same things we believe who have see the same warning signs we see who are trying to just do the best and the next thing in front of them um and what god is calling them to do mm -hmm. and i i think that was one of the biggest things about this weekend was feeling extremely connected like um i don't know it was really neat it, it, it was neat because it didn't matter where you were people mm -hmm. people would talk to you and then share their share their views mm -hmm. and share where they came from share the struggle and where they're at now in life and it's like we would be standing in line for food and people would be talking to us mm -hmm. about them we would be getting out of our car and walking to the event and people would stop getting us and add, yeah people. it's just it was it was it was eye-opening and inspirational and it was nice to see that uh, there's like-minded people we're not alone in what we're doing and wanting and, to do and, and it's amazing that there is a, a fight a, that people are opening up their eyes and they're saying no this is not the way i want to do it i want it to go natural less preservatives and be healthy yeah. and the fact that people go to these conventions and it doesn't matter 
where they are at. They, they're not even just from that area. People come from all over mm -hmm. the United States, as, as far as I know. And they were talking about uh, one of the, I think it was the ones we saw today, you saw, uh, how somebody messaged them through online, how uh, they were, where they taught these, these tribe. They were sharing yeah. on Facebook how to raise and butcher and process rabbits, I yeah. think it was. And they got a message from a missionary. Yes. Because they've they've always been like, I've never been called to be a missionary. I would think it would be really cool to be a missionary, but this is never something I've been called to do. Yeah. And yet their video was what you, this missionary used to teach an entire tribe in Africa. Africa. How to raise and butcher rabbits yeah. for food. And um, it's just, it's a really neat world and yeah. how everything connects. And to me, listening to that and knowing, I know I walked uh, my path with God. And I know everything we've done is because God's given us the gumption to do it and mm -hmm. the knowledge to do it. And, I mean, just look at us moving from California to where we are now. I feel like we're being called and I feel like this community is being called and I just it was, this this whole trip was inspirational and in a way it's God telling us to keep going I agree so before we close this out yeah. there's one more uh, person we saw um, that I interviewed. I'm going to try to get some of the background noise <laughs> in this clip cleared out. Um, but Azure Standard was there and as a vendor and a sponsor. And so David, who is the founder and CEO of um, Azure Standard, um, I got a picture with him mm -hmm. and I um, asked him a question for this video as well. Um, so I'm going to pop that in here works and I hope you can hear through um but um then we'll come back and we'll close out this video yep I truthfully actually didn't want to found Azure Standard that wasn't my goal I was a farmer we farmed farm organically we lost uh, we lost our market which before that was actually box ready oh nice they were they were who we sold to until the mid 80s okay and so I started going out trying to sell the product that we raised on our farm. Okay. And then um, I realized that there was a need in the marketplace. And I was probably the least qualified person in the world to do it. I had to learn and learn and learn and learn. Not just I had to learn business, I had to learn a lot about farming, I had to learn just a lot of a lot, about food. <laughs> a lot about transportation. Um, you know, I mean, in fact, I would have chosen somebody else, but he didn't. But you answered that call. That's amazing. And what I felt like it was you know, what was needed. So that was in the 80s? Yeah, I very, we first came up with the name in the 80s. Okay. It was like um, 87, 88. Right. So we're uh, almost 35 years old. Mm -hmm. So fun. We love you guys. I, I know we fell in love with the product. So I just, it's good. It's good for you. It's, even if it's not organic, it doesn't have the bad stuff anyway. <laughs> and, um, yeah, we just love the mission. Okay, I find it interesting that went right along with everything that we were just talking about, people being called to different things, and that's everybody's calling is going to be different. Everybody, what what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to do things, um, if they're supposed to share it, if they're not supposed to share it, like who they're supposed to share it with, how they're supposed to share it, all those things are going to be very different. Um, 
and that was one of the things that we really got out of this weekend right yeah was that inspiration and in, in what is it that we're being called to do and um what is our what is our story and what is god trying to use us for right and hearing hearing david say you know i wasn't planning on starting this year <laughs> like that wasn't my goal <laughs> like this wasn't like this wasn't in the the cards and it just i needed to find this and he needed to find the vendor uh, uh somebody else to sell his farm products to and he ended up finding a need and azure was born and that's amazing he he ended up listening to that call and god used him in a lot of ways and look at how many people they service and what a difference he's making in the world yeah. and what a difference they've been around for years 30 34 36 years yeah. something like that and look at the huge boom and the difference yeah. during 2020 and, and the fact that keep their values mm -hmm. the fact that he's one's clean the quality and all quality. Mm -hmm. He wants the best food for the pe people he serves. Is just is just amazing. Yep. So, to round out this video, I highly suggest if you can go to an homesteading thing near you, um, to go. It may not be one of the big ones like the Homesteading Festival or um, Homesteaders of America or something like that. But see if there is some sort of event like the um, Ozark Homesteading Expo that we went to. Um, see what's near you. Uh, connect with some of the community around you. Um, that was one of the big questions that was asked was like, how do you create this community? How do you create... A community where you have people with shared skills and so forth and I, I really think going to these and making some connections is a good way to do so um, is one of the big steps you oh, you're yeah. learning you're talking to people um, you're building connections you're, and you're finding skills and our goal is not to be self-sufficient our goal is to become community sufficient yeah. and um, and I think doing that with intentionality is important. And um, I just, I think it's amazing um, all the yeah. things that happen out of this. We gained a lot of knowledge, but we gained more connection yeah. and inspiration and I think a deeper why. Why we're going down the path that we're going down. And then also knowing that we're not alone is a good thing too. Yeah. Not not that we're alone because we always have God with us. Well, we have we have people around but we, us. We have people, and but sometimes you get crazy looks for going. Oh, I'm not going to spray this, or I'm not going to do this, or I only want to grow this way, or I'm growing soil, not plants, like you start going off on roundup and the the effects it has that, and demos and, and, and people's eyes is glaze over <laughs> and, and that's i think that's what people will look at uh, our communities and say huh those guys are right these things are killing us mm -hmm. in the future yeah i think that um Right now we're cuckoo, but we'll see. Yeah, I think I think there was a lot under this. So if you can go, go. Um, the tickets to the event this year were only fifty bucks a piece um, for this one, and there was VIP tickets that were more. Um, we just got the regular ones. Mm -hmm. I think most of our expense was the hotel, or maybe shopping. I think we did good. It was, we, did it, good. It was, we got a few things, it was all but right. yeah. we curved ourselves. Um, we didn't go too crazy. And we packed a bunch of like our drinks and some food and stuff like that, and we ate some food there. Yeah. But um, I think it's worth it, and I think it's amazing. Um, I'd love to know what some of your favorite 
um, homesteading events are. We are newer to the community here. Um, and so maybe there's somebody near your community that is searching for events. So if you can drop below any of your favorite homesteading style events um, that are near you in the comments, um, then other people can um, look at that as a resource to find out what can maybe be near yeah, them. Yeah, because a lot of people don't know. Mm -hmm. And wealth is knowledge. Yes, it is. Wealth is knowledge. Wealth. 100%. Yeah. So that's it for today's video. I know it's a longer one, but it's a fun one. And um, we thank you for watching. And um, if you're one of the people that we met at the um, Ozark Homesteading Expo, welcome to our channel. We absolutely loved meeting you. Mm -hmm. And um, we hope to see you next year at yeah. the next one. We'll see you on the next video. Bye. Bye.